So he's, he's going to be shortly telling us about digital tax in the physical realm, as we can see by the PowerPoint he's opening right there. So if, if of course, as PowerPoint slowly starts up, gotta love PowerPoint 2013. If you hit F5, it'll do presentation view. Now, uh, yeah, everybody go bananas for Grape Ape. You're too kind, and I'm too sober. All right, so uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Phil Grimes, they call me the Grape Ape, among other things, normally when I'm not in the room, though. Uh, I am a security researcher, uh, mostly independent. I do a bunch of different things. Most of it includes breaking stuff. Um, but today we're going to talk about, oh, that screws up the headings. You're going to have a hard time reading my title. Sorry for the craziness. We're going to talk about digital attacks in the physical realm and, wow, really? No, it's not. It was white. Yeah. That's, well, that's okay. The good thing is most of my slides are pictures, so we don't have to worry about the words. We're just going to make it through this. So the bar is right outside the door. Enjoy yourselves, and we'll figure it out. Um, so who am I? Well, I, I, I'm a lot of things. I wear a whole bunch of different hats in my world. Uh, I, I've been called schizophrenic, uh, multi, multiple personality disorder. But it all boils down to the fact that I really can't sit still. I have to keep moving and doing stuff. Um, I am a martial artist. I've studied several different styles of martial arts through my lifetime. Uh, it's something that helps you to train your mind, body, and soul as one, center your chi and all of that stuff. But it's also different systems of manipulating, uh, manipulating an attacker, right? Manipulating an attacker and being able to defend yourself, so like what our blue teams are. Um, I've also found out not too long ago that I actually have some pirate blood in my family. Uh, my sister recently did one of these what do you call it, that Ancestry.com thing, and found that we have some ties to a pirate from the 1500s somewhere in England. So I think that's pretty cool because it really kind of fits my personality as a breaker. Um, I'm also a biker. I ride with uh, one of the largest motorcycle clubs in the world. Most of the time I'm on my bike. If I didn't have so much equipment, I would, uh, I would have been on it this weekend. Um, but that teaches, uh, you know, teaches me how to interact with society because most people think or see a biker, think of a biker or see one, and they're like, oh, you know, that's a bad guy. Um, but it's not always like that. Uh, I'm proud to, to not be one of those. You know, the gangster for good, you've seen, you may, if you follow me on Twitter, I, I have been using that hashtag a lot lately because I believe in standing up for right, uh, which is why I, I do what I do. Uh, but th that gives me the opportunity really to... Uh, to interact with the public on a different level and to see how perception manages uh, reputation. I'm also a parent. I'm blessed to have five kids at home. Um, I'm only 34, so do the math there. Uh, I actually have my second child that's an adult now and going off to college, so that's pretty cool. Uh, how, how many people in here have parents or have kids? Have parents. Everybody has a parent. Who has kids? Kids, so those of you with your hands up probably know that uh, parenting is really nothing more than a lifelong social engineering experiment, right? Um, and it all boils down, all of these things make me a hacker. Uh, I don't think hacker's a bad word, and, and as a hacker, it's, it's more about manipulating systems, whatever that may be, right? Figuring out how something is supposed to work, what is it supposed to do, and then how can I manipulate those things to do something different, either bad or good, something that it's not intended for. Uh, and that's really the kind of thing that we're going to talk about today. Um, so, oh no, don't do that. I know, right? Okay, so, um, when we're talking about the digital attacks in a physical realm, everybody in here familiar with the OWASP top 10? Comfortable enough to at least mosey through it? Anybody never heard of the OWASP top 10? Okay, so today we're going to go through what these things that most of us are familiar with look like in a totally different realm. So I'm going to, I'm going to walk you through what the OWASP top 10 is, we're going to go with 20, well, we're actually going to look at 2010 and 2013 and the changes there because I disagree with it and I think OWASP is kind of off kilt. But 
uh, we're going to look at how to apply those same principles to the physical world. So what does SQL injection look like when, it, when you're attacking the human element? How does cross-site scripting look when I'm targeting a physical organization? When we're looking at guards, guns, and gates, but applying the same techniques that we use when we're attacking web applications, or in the case of the blue teamers, how we're defending from those similar attacks. Anybody, got, anybody know this guy? I'm dating myself because I've, I cannot tell you how many people I've been showing these pictures to and I get that glazed over look in their eye. Uh, but Max Hedrum is going to be our attacker today for the most part, so we're going to be talking about Max a lot. Um, and some of you may remember uh, Chicago in the what late 80s, early 90s, there was an attacker that was actually a, dressed, with, dressed as Max Hedrum, was able to intercept the TV signal in Chicago during a, a football game or Super Bowl or something, I believe, and, to, and was actually able to capture the signal and control it for several minutes and dance around like a fool, calling the TV station out, telling they're idiots because they can't do anything about it, and really they couldn't. Um, so we're going to use Max today as uh, one of our examples. So this is the OAuth top 10. Can you see that okay? I didn't know if it was big enough, but... Uh, Okay, so I disagree with OWASP on some of the things here. Because first of all, we look at A1, um, and again, I'm going to be going down the, the right side here for 2013. So A1, A3, uh, and A8. Injection attacks, cross-site scripting, and cross-site request forgery. I think all of those really should fall under injection attacks, right? Because in, we are injecting data into the application trying to attack, right? So that's why I kind of disagree with OWASP a little bit. And because of that, as we go through this, you're gonna see that I've, uh, I've, I've either combined a few or you're gonna see some mitigation or attack strategies kind of repeat. So don't be surprised when we see that. We're gonna go over A1 first, injection attacks. Now, the injection attacks, they're typically talking like SQL injection here, right? So we're passing untrusted data to the interpreter, or we're, we're exploiting unintended trust because we don't necessarily understand data flow between our assets in the digital aspect, right? Um, or unauthorized access or lack of sanitation. These are the things that cause almost every, I, I'll go so far as to say every injection attack that we can leverage. It's one of those root causes. So let's take Max, and if Max goes and profiles an organization, you know, gets on the phone, he says, hey, tech support Tim, this is legitimate Larry calling you from the sales, uh, the sales office, and you know, I just got back from uh, vacation, and I, I, I lost my password to my workstation. Can you help me to reset that so I can you know, get my invoices out and make a little profit for the company? And, you know, of course, Tim wants to do his job. He wants to help Larry out here and make sure that he's able to get the, the sales. Otherwise, he may not have a job to come back to. So we start to see a problem there. As soon as we give that attacker an injection point into the physical organization, now they're going to have access to those credentials and to be able to start leveraging their way in using those social engineering attacks. So by leveraging, by injecting the false interpretation to uh, Tim here, Larry's able to get a little bit of information, able to dump the database, as it were, and get some information that he couldn't otherwise normally get. So another, uh, another example, Max gets on the phone again. Hello, Marketing Molly. Hey, uh, this, is, uh, this is Clark calling you from valued customer, and I just got your marketing slick, and I love your new product. I really want to buy this. You know, I've been looking for something like this forever, but I'll tell you, it's really weird. I, I got your email, I opened up your PDF document, and now my computer's running really slow. Can you look at that for me? I just forwarded the document back to you. Tell me if it happens to you. Any, do we have social engineers in here? You, have you ever done anything like this? Yeah, huh? Has Bob? My friend Bob has. So the, again, getting get able to extract information from a target, making the person do something that they shouldn't or wouldn't normally do by lulling them into that false sense of security, by injecting that data into the parser, and then when it, when it reads back, it gives you what it thinks you want. Well, 
We don't really do that. Do we have any help desk people in here? None? I'm sorry? X? You ever, do we set, reset passwords over the phone? Do you? Yeah? Do you just give them the password? No. No. Maybe. Right? No. No. Validate. Why are you asking for this? You know, prove it. Let me get an email from your supervisor. We have to have some sort of a process. We have to have some validation in place to prevent this injection. And secondly, I wish jaded security was here. Just don't. Just don't. We don't click things. Not only that, but if, again, you implement some validation there, hey, I just got this, this PDF emailed to me. Did you really mean to send that? Is that really legit? Well, of course, if you're calling Max, he's going to tell you, yeah, sure. But hopefully, you know, the, the, the validation there, you're calling a number you know, you're talking to a voice that you trust, and you're hopefully able to eliminate a lot of those issues. Right. So uh, the next one here then, broken authentication and session management. Now this is off, uh, often because in web apps we just do it wrong. We try to roll our own solution or we only you know, half implement something and we get diverted to another project or you know, I see a lot of heads nodding out there. So you feel where I'm coming from with that. But we're gonna put a spin on it here. So we've got Janitor Jerry well, and uh, Janitor Jerry works for a cleaning crew who is going to go into Compromise Credit Union and he sweeps the floors at night, right? But when Max assumes Jerry's identity and he's able to sleep, slip in under the radar and starts wandering through Compromise Credit Union's hallways while the rest of the staff is gone, it's just the cleaning crew, he's checking locked doors, making sure that they're locked, and when they're not, he goes in to clean check and lock desk drawers, and when they're not, he goes in to clean. Well, he finds some interesting things. We find some passwords on post-it notes. My favorite place is under the phone or under the keyboard. You all know what I'm talking about, right? But there, it gets worse. He keeps walking, keeps walking, and in a management office, under the phone, on a post-it note, scribbled just under the password to get onto his workstation, is an odd phrase, and he can't really tell what, what this is until a little bit later in the search when the, we're looking through HR and we see that this is actually the phrase that we, call, we give to the cops when we trip the alarm. So now we were able to call off the dog. So let me just slip that in my pocket and I'm gonna keep cleaning. We got several more offices to get to, right? At the reception desk, I'm almost done. We clean the whole building, and Max is able to, to, to feel pretty good. He's got several credentials now. He's got some access. He's got a way to call the cops off if for, for some reason he trips an alarm. And then he finds the Holy Grail. We open the drawer, and there's two keys on a ring sitting right where the pens should go in your desk. And they're keys to the front door. So we can trip the alarm without breaking anything, who cares? We can call the cops off so we have all the time in the world and anybody who has any experience with a physical security system knows that it's gonna bark and be loud but it shuts up eventually and nobody's gonna come. Take it a, a little bit further here. So now we have Max is profiling uh, ultimate utility here. We're going after critical infrastructure now. Max is able to wander in through an un unguarded access point in the building and basically just pretends like he knows where he's supposed to be. I'll tell you, a clipboard, a pen, and a rolled up piece of paper, people usually don't ask questions, which we'll talk about a little more here later on. But Max is walking around and just watching, not doing anything, but just watching. And uh, one of the things that... Uh, that surprises him is there's like a, a, setting, a segmented area of the building that's guarded. It has a, a, a guy sitting there saying, hey, no, you can't come in, right? Well, the guard takes a lunch break and nobody relieves him and he just walks right on past. And continuing to walk through, now he's in the executive offices and able to sit back and watch. And there's one guy sitting back and he's just kind of taking his time. Looks like he's crunching some numbers, working pretty hard. But every few, every few minutes, he'll get up, 
walk into a, a main hallway where it looks like they have this big vault. And he'll kind of stand there and just stare at the vault, almost like he's using the Jedi mind trick to open the door. And then he just kind of saunters and daydreams off up in, in looking up in the sky. And, you know, Max can't figure out why, time after time, this guy's able to, to go and have this ritual of thinking so hard before he punches in the numbers and is able to get access to the vault. So things clear out toward the end of the day, and Max goes over and repeats the, repeats the thing. I mean, he tries to open that vault just as hard as he can, and it doesn't budge. So he starts to daydream and daydream. And as he looks up on the white of the drop ceiling, sure enough, written in pencil, is the combination to the vault. Now, that's a true story. I, that's a true story. These are the kind of things that we just cannot have. And I meant to have that, but sorry. But really? Come on. Are you kidding me? Like, these are the things that shouldn't happen, especially for critical infrastructure. If you have, if you have experience in this kind of stuff, you realize how that, that little bit is going to cause such a cascading failure that it could destroy an organization. And once you destroy the reputation there, what else do we have? There's very little. Not much, if anything. So, on to cross-site scripting. This is everywhere, and I hate it. But it can be dangerous. Uh, cross-site scripting's been seen to do some pretty nasty stuff. I mean, it can, you can uh, deface a website. We've been able to see malicious redirects, right? So it pushes you off to another site, like hackme.ru, and downloads that Trojan dropper. Cross-site scripting can be uh, coupled or, or chained with other issues, other vulnerabilities in an application that can really lead to the king's keys to the kingdom eventually, especially something like cross-site request forgery, which we'll talk about shortly, or SQL injection, which we spoke about already. But more validation. If we're validating these things, then we're able to start locking down our perimeter, which we know, you know, I, I, we talk about the perimeter in the, in the physical sense, that's much harder to do, especially with this attack. Now, cross-site scripting is one of the most common things that we actually see in the wild from terms of social engineering standpoints. We have things like stealing checks out of a mailbox, washing the check clean and reprinting it to go cash it. Uh, you ever seen the movie Catch Me If You Can? Right? Frank Abagnale was a master at that. I mean, he's, he's been brilliant. We have the, the door-to-door -door salesman who's trying to con the old lady out of 40% of her, her social security check to try and get a seller the next whiz-bang whatever that never ends up making it if he can get her to write the check out or, God forbid, give him cash before he gets out the door. Um, we'll talk shortly about one of my favorite, uh, this is actually something my dad told me about, so I'm really kind of excited to get to share part of uh, his world in mine, because that doesn't happen too often, but law enforcement, socially engineers, what? We don't do that. Um, and we've got Victor Lustig, anybody know this name? Victor Lustig, the only man in history who successfully sold the Eiffel Tower, not once, but three times. Now that's pretty boss, I have to say, right? So we're gonna talk first about the short con. Um, I was driving home one day and getting off the freeway, there, it was a sad sight for a minute, only a minute. I'm not very compassionate most of the time, but you know, this, this scene really got to me. This uh, mid-20s, man standing with a, a feed me I'm hungry help me I'm hungry sign in one hand and a small child in the other now being a parent myself that really touched me so I'm sitting and do as I do those of you who know me I'm a watcher so I just sat back and watched and I waited I wanted to see what was going to happen and as the light changed this guy folds the sign up, puts it in his pocket, and sets the kid down on the ground. He's realizing he's not going to get any more money from the people who are stopped at this cycle of the light. So he's not really worried too much about their, what they see or their perception. Puts the kid down, folds the sign up, reaches in his pocket, and pulls out a brand new iPhone. Now, that tells me that the funds that we're putting here are misappropriated. 
I'll buy a man a sandwich if he's hungry. I'll buy his kid food. But uh, giving him cash for something like that, I really have a problem with. Uh, who's been to DerbyCon? Right. DerbyCon's awesome. Love it. Der uh, was at DerbyCon two, the last two years in a row now, and I've been approached by the same man who, who gave me a very similar, uh, didn't use the kid, but a similar story. He's, man, I, I'm here on a karate tournament, and I missed my bus to get home. Do you have any money that I can put toward a bus ticket? I said, buddy, I'll walk with you and buy you a bus ticket. He didn't want nothing to do with that. Nothing to do with it. I mean, you'd have thought that I, that I called his mom a name you shouldn't say. You know, so these are the kind of things that really start to degrade our society and make stuff difficult because then you don't trust anybody, right? I don't want to give you money. And if you're not going to accept my, my generosity, then why would I want it? So the next time you find somebody holding that sign, you may not even offer because why? What's it worth? What happened? Yeah, yeah. And the sad thing is a lot of people like that are, I mean, legit need it. Really, I mean, there was a story not long ago about a cop that walked and bought him, uh, that bought a man's shoes on the side of the street because he, could, he had bare feet in the middle of winter, and I think this was in New York City or something silly like that, right? So, but generosity is good. Unfortunately, we live in an ugly world, and we have, ex we have things like this happening all the time. Uh, I, mentioned, I mentioned my dad. Uh, he was a cop for a good portion of his life, uh, 20 plus 20, 20, 20, 25 years, roughly. And he told me about a gig that they did back in, this was, I think, sometime in the late 70s, early 80s. But they had a bunch of felony warrants that needed to be served, and these were kind of cold cases. They had no address that was good. They had no place to serve the warrant. Um, and, and I don't know if, uh, you know, that's hard to do. You know, what are you going to do? How are you going to get these people? Well, Slowly, they were able to find a good address on most of these people, and through bounty hunters or others that are trying to help law enforcement, they're able to find where these guys are, but they're not always able to find when they're going to be there. It's mom's address, or it's a cousin's address, or it's baby's mama's niece's neighbor, or something like that, right? But they get smart. So the cops think, all right, we're going to send them some mail, but we need to make sure that they open it and that they, they're enticed. How are we going to do this? So they send them a surprise, you win, sweepstakes, right? But it's not really a sweepstakes. It's a, you have, you've won a prize. Come, and cl come claim your prize. We're giving away TVs. We're giving away cash. We're giving away game systems. We're, come get it. So then they take over a, a small port of, part of an office building and they set it up for, there's a reception area, you walk in the door and people are there waiting for you and there's a line of people, so this looks real. You see every once in a while somebody will walk back through the door with their little slip, give it to the, the reception lady and they walk out carrying a TV. So how would you not? Like, all right, I'll wait, sure. Walk back, hand your paper, and the nice officer says, off we go, buddy. You put on them silver bracelets and get to spend some day at Club Fed. Now, that is, is social engineering used for good, where we see that you can apply these principles to both sides of the fence. But that actually shows us ways that we're able to, uh, to manipulate the system, manipulate the ways that people are, uh, are viewing the data that they're interpreting. And why does this, how do we stop it? How do we stop it? Well, we have to validate. If you and I look at the same thing and we see it differently, we're going to call it two different things. If you don't validate, if you get that postcard in the mail and you know they're looking for you, if you don't like the feel of steel on your skin, you might want to double check. Where is this address? Who, who, who owns this office building? Why are people giving this stuff away? I never gave you my address. How did you know to find me? Right? This is the same thing that criminals use when they steal your debit card information, when they use your, your banking information to buy a video game, which actually just happened to a friend of mine here recently too, just for stupid things because we aren't paying attention. We don't validate and it ends up biting us in the butt. Oh, that's terrible. Okay, so I'm gonna read these. I, I hate reading slides, I'm sorry, but uh, so we, we're covering two here, in, uh, insecure direct object reference and sensitive data exposure. Um, web app people? Who? How many? 
moderate bit. How, any, uh, who's not comfortable with these two concepts? In, in, insecure direct object rec reference and sensitive data exposure. We're going to try and put it in terms that we are all comfortable with. Does anybody recognize this picture? Anybody know what this is? Any history buffs in here? It is a bunker, but very specific. This is a bunker called the Maginot Line. Anybody know that phrase? Hear of it? Okay. The Maginot Line was built by the French uh, just after World War I because they saw static defenses weren't really helping. So they built this line along the French-German border to basically stop the invasion of Germany. Well, the Maginot Line was a phenomenal build for the 1940s. I mean, they had gun, uh, machine gun embankments, they had uh, tank uh, ways for the, the M1s to get through, they had sleeping quarters for something like 4,000 soldiers, and the, the thing that I think is the single biggest marvel, it was air conditioned in the 1940s. How cool is that? This was such a marvel at the time that um, dignitaries from all over the world came to see this specimen. They wanted to know what it was like. They had to see it for themselves. Our own president went to go see it. Why did the Maginot Line fail? You're the only one that said you knew it. Anybody else? The Germans just went around it. It stopped. It stopped at Italy. So they just went around it. We didn't need it. So, but you don't realize, though, that they did actually have uh, the, they had the, the Ap Alpine. It's the Alpine line, which was the southern border for Italy. So they just went up and went around Switzerland and came right through. The Germans started their invasion May 10th, 1941. It took them two weeks. And most of that was travel time. Very little battle. Okay, so what we're talking about here is, sure, we've got defenses, but do they actually work? So now we're going to play on one of, one of humanity's biggest and, in my opinion, ugliest addictions. I'm a former smoker myself, so I feel I can say that, uh, but people will do anything to get their next fix. This costs companies hundreds of millions of dollars a year. This is also a very weak point in the system because what do we do when we're outside smoking? And we talk, right? And we, I mean, we just relax. We're outside of work. We're, this is our break time. We should be able to let our defenses down, right? But for a small investment of $5.95, Max, Max buys himself a pack of cigarettes and goes and sits in the smoker's shack for a day and just watches and listens and observes and buys another pack and goes back the next day and starts talking and engaging the people that are out there. And before long, they hold the door open for him. This is, again, a true story. This happens all the time. I've actually accomplished the same thing with donuts. Donuts in a vendor shirt works awesome. People love it. If they see donuts coming in, I like, here, here, well, you want my key card? Like, donuts are amazing. You would think that they were, like, laced with crack or something. But what the heck? Why? Like, okay, all right. I'm told regularly that I'm scary. And I think I'm a pretty darn nice guy, but I accept the fact that I'm ugly. It's not my fault. I can't help it. When I go and am profiling or attacking a physical organization, people don't even think to ask. They don't stop me. I'm six foot five, 280 pounds. They're, they're not going to stop me and say, who are you? No, who are you? That's the real question. Why are you stopping me? What makes you think that you can stop me? Now, get out of my way. I got work to do. And most of the time, people are timid, and they'll back down from that, right? This is the kind of stuff that we, as a, as a community, we have to be changing. We have to make people, especially whether, whether you are, are working directly for an organization that you're protecting, or if you're a consultant, we need our people, our biggest asset out there, to start engaging foreign objects, be that digital, physical, or whatever, asking questions and starting to understand what they're dealing with. Dang, I'm sorry, you had another one here. So this one's uh, security misconfiguration and using components with known vulnerabilities. So this one is when, uh, when we go and buy the next silver bullet. 
I had a, a call one time with a guy. I was doing a penetration test, and I went from the, the external perimeter, right, their web application, to domain admin in under two hours. <clears throat> now, that's a big problem. And I asked the guy, I was like, hey, do you have a firewall? So yeah, yeah, I got a firewall. We just, we just spent like 250 grand on it last year. It's <clears throat> like, all right, so where is your firewall? He said, it's sitting right here beside me. But you're in an office, where's your data center? It's in the office up the street. He hadn't even taken the firewall out of the box. <laughs> Quarter of a million dollars spent and didn't even open the thing. And this is the kind of stuff that we, are need, we really need to change. So now we're going to consider, this is going to be John Public, John Q. John and his beautiful family just got a great opportunity because John got, a, got the dream job of his life. He's, he's going to make about three times more money than he's ever made before. And unfortunately, that means more hours, but they're going to get a nice house. He's found, found a great place during the relocation. and They're, they're going to buy this, their dream home, basically. So life is, is starting to shape up. And when they move into the house, or before they move into the house, John says, I love my family. I'm going to spare no expense. Guards, guns, and gates all the way. Two German shepherds, a pit bull, a Doberman, and all this stuff here, plus a gun in every room in the house. Well, Max is back to his good deeds again, but this time he's got himself uh, a little buddy and they start profiling this property. Now, John didn't realize taking this job for a high-profile organization is really gonna make him a prime target because he's gonna work from home sometimes. How do they know he's not gonna, how does the attacker know they're not gonna be able to steal a little bit of proprietary data from his home network? So we wanna get in here and see. So Max uh, dresses up as the dog catcher and goes by and says, hey, I had a complaint about your pit bull. He seems a little angry. Well, they show him around the property, introduce him to the dogs, let him, let him in, you know, come, come see. Our dogs aren't vicious. They're family. They're part of the family, just like my kids. So we're able to see the brand of the cameras in the house. That gives us another point for recon. They're able to see the deadbolt on the front door that, is, that uses a keypad. They're able to recognize, hey, only three of the numbers on that keypad look discolored. Hmm. A little bit more recon, and we're able, to, uh, we're able to see, learn default passwords for the system that we've spent so much time and money on. And then he, he has his little buddy, Nick Nefarious, come by, and Nick dresses up as the uh, T cable TV guy and says, hey, we have a, we're having a problem in the neighborhood. I need to get in and look at your lines. And Nick's able to get in and type a few, connect to the network, type in real quick, and gets the, uh, the public IP address now of this property while Max is off on their command center doing MMAP scan. Now we find, hey, there are some ports open here. Let's look at those. Looks like the uh, D-Link interface for those cameras. Now, those never come with default credentials, do they? And even if they did, we always change them, don't we? No, no, no. So, this, again, the cascading failure, by, by manipulating the people, we're able to take advantage of that. But we have to think. We have to be thinking about how this is being designed, how it's being implemented, implemented, and how it can be abused. And then what we have to do to be able to wrap controls around our sensitive data and prevent that, sto that sort of access. So if the dog catcher shows up at your house, are you, would you really just let him in? I'd call somebody, prove it, paperwork, right? Validate. Oh, this one was the, one of the funniest slides here. Uh, all right, so this is missing function level access control, uh, and the, the picture is missing, so it's supposed to be funny, but sorry. So Max again, right? Max now profiles, we're going after a hospital and uh, just wanders in off the street and starts walking around. And instead of, of uh, looking at, at people this time, he's just touching doors. If there's, a, if there's a door handle, he just gives it a little tap. Is it open? Can we get in there? Well, when we can, boy, that makes us happy. It may say restricted, but if there's not a lock on it, what's going to keep him out? Or if it doesn't close fast enough when someone comes out, what's going to keep him from tailgating his way in? 
So that makes Max happy. He enjoys being able to go places that they tell him he shouldn't go. I love that. You tell me I can't do something, hide and watch. I'm going to do it. But again, this goes back to asking questions. We have to, we have to be willing to confront foreigners in a protected space. Not only do we want to confront them, but we want to make them satisfy our curiosity. Don't just be complacent. Don't just be like, yeah, I asked him his name and walked away. You know, We have to be willing to stop people and get them to explain to us why they're there. I don't know who you are. I need to see a badge. Who's your supervisor? And they just, they just don't do that. These are the kind of things that I'm hoping that you'll take away today and uh, to be able to share with everybody else we come in contact who, do, who does things like this. All right, so this one's cross-site request forgery. Um, cross-site request forgery can be very nasty. I mean, you can, you can uh, change passwords on people, log them out. Logging out is like kind of the prank, cross-site request forgery, right? Hey, click this link, poof, you're logged out of the forum. Ha, 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 I got you. But if you construct it properly, hey, next thing you know, I've changed your password. Has anybody seen any of my cross-site request forgery work in here? Okay, I've got some videos out. If you're interested, uh, at the end of the talk, you'll see a link to my website. I've got my videos on the cross-site request forgery, and it shows some of the really cool stuff that you can do with it and how simple it is to be exploited. But Max and Nick are at it again. And this time, they got uh, nice Nancy here, and they're going after her. They, wanted, they want to take her money. This poor old lady, before she hits the grave, they're going to tap her bank account and run up as much credit as they possibly can. These guys do not care. They have no regard for the victim on the other end. All they're worried about is getting that money, selling those credentials, recycling the information, and destroying your life. So we, Max and Nick start you know, digging through the mail. We uh, find a credit application and fill it out. We do a couple of door visits and see if we aren't able to talk Nancy into giving us some information that she really shouldn't give. One of those just so happens to be a Census Bureau worker. And of course, I need your social security number to be able to prove that you are who you say you are, right? I mean, Nancy's been doing these for 200 years. She, that's not out of the ordinary to her. Sure, okay, here. Through some malicious phone attacks, uh, phone calls, we're able to, sit, to get a little more information to be able to actually do something dangerous. And before long, Max now has a credit card in Nancy's name and is running this poor lady's name through the mud. Yeah. All right, so we're getting to the last story. I know I'm running quite close on time here. This is unvalid redirects and forwards. Okay. Um, you, oh, you guys are going to love this. True story. True story. Um, I was flown to do an assessment one time on, uh, this was again critical infrastructure, and they told me whatever you had to do, I want, to say, I want you to get in. No scope. Just do it. All right. So I was expecting a challenge. I get my rental car, drive from the airport to the site, and I pull up to a gate with a guard booth, with a guard, and no, he was not asleep. But I walked up to the, uh, drove up to the guard, and I, I said, you know, my name's Joe, and I'm here to see one of your employees. And I dropped a name that I pulled off the internet that had nothing to do with anything for my assessment. I just threw a name at him. He said, oh, if you're, see, if you're here to see employees, you need to drive around the building here to the other side. There's a parking lot over there that's not gated. Park over there, and you can walk right to the door. Interesting. All right. So I did what the man said. He's a guard in position of power. Drive around, and I, I want to see what this lot is. So I get over there, I park, and it's not just a parking lot. But this is, uh, there's also two big garage bays where they park their trucks for service and then a line of these service trucks. So I get out of my car and being the, the thorough tester that I am, I check the doors on the trucks as I'm walking the line. And sure enough, there's a door open and sitting in the cup holder are the keys. Well, I don't need those. That's not my focus. I get in, I keep walking and the garage bays are wide open. Middle of summer, garage bays are wide open. The two guys are working on one of the trucks in one of the bays, and I just walked in and walked right past them. They didn't stop me. They didn't say hello. They didn't even look up from their work. 
they just let, I walked right in. I'm wandering for several, several minutes, way longer than I should have. And I, t- I turn around the corner and I see the CEO, the CIO, and uh, my contact for this engagement walking, talking together. And the guy looks at me and he's like, I mean, I'm pretty, I'm, I got a pretty distinct face. I'm not hard to forget. He's like, he's like, and he just hangs his head in shame. And he just like, I don't get it. How'd you get in here? So I told him, I told him exactly what I did. Your guard told me where to park and the door was open. So the three, well, the three of them escorted me to the guard shack and they asked the guard, is this really what happened? Absolutely. And they fired the man on the spot. Again, critical infrastructure. We can't afford these types of things. Okay. This is just, a, uh, I, I had access from, from this assessment. I, it would have been like, uh, what was the Batman movie with, Scar, with uh, Scarecrow? The Dark Knight, is that the right one? Batman Begins, thank you. I had access to, I could have poisoned the entire, uh, the entire population's water system, basically, from, from doing something like this. Bad news. Oh, yeah. All right, so that's, uh, that's the end of my material here. You're not going to be able to see the link, so if anybody uh, is interested to be able to check that website for the cross-site request forgery or anything else that I've done, you get, I got a lot of information on there. Uh, I appreciate your time. Thanks very much. If you have questions, um, I got a few minutes yet that I can field those, or I'll be around for the rest of the weekend if you can catch me from running. Oh, oh, question? Absolutely. That's a, that's a very good question. How do we sell this? So I talk a good game, but how do we get that management buy-in that we all need to make it happen, right? You're going to have to pay somebody to come and do this. How do we make it happen? Unfortunately, as sad as I am to say, most organizations don't care enough to do anything about this stuff. They realize it. They just don't want it to be tested because they know they're going to fail. Uh, who, who in here does, does any kind of physical penetration testing? Okay, so we have several people in here. So in that, in that sense, right, that's our biggest issue. It's, it's getting the management buy-in to be able to get them to do it. And they, they usually aren't going to do anything about it until after. But if you can take baby steps and try to work little bits of it into scope as assessments come about, I found that that's really the best way to get management to accept it because they're, they're afraid. They know they're going to fail. But if you're also able to say, well, we're not just going to test it, but we're going to take those results, we're going to analyze them, and then we're going to create an awareness program for our people. You know, Now, the, the, this is going to be significantly more expensive because most places aren't going to have anything like this in play. But if we're able to stop buying the silver bullets, start investing in our people, then we have one of the best IDS, IPS systems available. So that's it. It's just a matter of baby steps, in my opinion. You can get there. I've seen it done. But it's, it's getting away from these shops that are like, okay, I'm going to give you a penetration test. Here's your unvalidated Nessus scan. And it's more like getting people who care about making security uh, at the forefront. Sure. I'll tell you what, um, what I've seen work is give them incentive. It doesn't have to be big, but a movie ticket or, uh, you know, here's an hour off. 
paid. You know, whatever you're able to build in, if you can make them want to, so that's a, that, I have a two-part answer. So that's how we accomplish it. But more than that, we also have to make the employees want to say something. So we have to encourage that. We have to make them feel like they're not whistleblowers. You're not a tattletale. You're, you are our anomaly detection. You are what's on the front lines. You know our business processes better than the detached managers most of the time. When you see something that's not normal, I want you to say something, and when you do, I praise you, I reward you for it somehow. And not only, you don't, it doesn't even have to be I give you something all the time. Public recognition goes a long way in the workforce. published. Yep. So he gets that public recognition, public recognition, a little bit of incentive, and management's able to see this is working. Let's keep doing this. And our awareness programs, where they exist, they are working. We're seeing it. It's an uphill battle. We've got a long way to fight because we have to be right every day. They only have to be right once. You know, we've got an uphill battle, but as long as we're trying, it's, it's paying off. Anymore? They didn't give me any tickets, uh, so I'll tell you what, find me between today and uh, the beginning of talks tomorrow, and I'll figure out, I'll, I'll tweet something, so follow me, I'll tweet something, and I'll find a way to, to get some tickets out to people. Last chance? Questions? No? Okay. Thanks a lot. I appreciate your time. <laughs>